the U.S. Treasury has what it calls the Conscience Fund. And this is basically a fund that was established in 1811, beginning with a $5 donation. And the basic idea of it is if people feel guilty about something they've done to the government, they can send the money in. The last records that they released were in 1986, and in 175 years, they have brought in almost $6 million to the Conscience Fund. Most of them uh, are anonymous. Someone made a nine cent donation uh, decades ago because they reused a three cent stamp a couple times. A person from Jersey City sent $40,000 in uh, several installments for $8,000 he had previously taken from the government. One lady sent in a bunch of handmade quilts to pay for her tax bill. Sometimes we wonder how sincere people are. This is probably the best. They received this letter. Dear Internal Revenue Service, I have not been able to sleep at night because I cheated on last year's income tax. Enclosed, find a cashier's check for $1,000. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the balance. <laughs> Conscience, guilt is an interesting thing in people's lives. And in Genesis chapter 42, the Bible is going to show us some of what this carrying guilt does to people. So Genesis chapter 42. We have... Twelve brothers, ten of them decide to sell the one they don't like because of some dreams that he had and told them about it. <clears throat> they sell him into slavery, ends up in Egypt, a whole long series of events. Uh, he ends up being the second most powerful person in the land of Egypt. We've had seven great years, lots of food. Uh, he, Joseph has been in charge of storing all this food up, but now we've got, according to the dreams of Pharaoh that Joseph interpreted, we're going to have seven bad years, and we're into the middle of the bad years. And so we pick up in Genesis 42 with this statement. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you sitting around looking at one another? He said, behold, I've heard that there's grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. <clears throat> it's amazing what people do when they get hungry. But we see here kind of an underlying problem that we find in this family. And, and you almost kind of need a scorecard for it. So Jacob falls in love with a girl named Rachel. Request her hand in marriage. She's the younger sister. She's the pretty one. His father-in-law-to-be gets him drunk on his wedding night, and when he wakes up in the morning, behold, he's married to the ugly sister. Oh, the Bible is a little bit nicer in the way it says it. She had weak eyes. I mean, she's not attractive. And so he has to work another seven years to get to marry the one that he loves the most, which is Rachel. So Leah, the, the not-so-attractive sister, starts to have children, and Rachel has no children. So Rachel decides that she wants to have kids, so she offers Jacob her handmaid, and so those kids will be considered her kids. So she has a couple kids. Leah quits having kids, so she offers her handmaid. So have a couple kids. And then Rachel, she starts having kids. She has a couple kids, Joseph and Benjamin. I told you, you need a scorecard. You're like, wow, was life really like that back then? Are you kidding me? Life's still like that today for many people. Like, it's just it's hard sometimes to track it all. And so that's why so, so we have all of these half-brothers that, that have you know, four different moms and one dad. They're all living together. Um, and two of them come from the favored wife, Rachel. So those two, Joseph and Benjamin, become the favored sons. Because of Jacob's favor for Joseph and because of the way he was, his dreams, his brothers would someday bow down to him and all that, that's why they sell Joseph when he's 17 years old to uh, slave traders who take him to Egypt. So Jacob says, I'm not about to send the other favored son, Benjamin. So he sends the ten brothers instead. So we have Joseph in Egypt, Benjamin stays home, we have the, the ten brothers go. Now, the motivating drive for all this, every, really the, the whole theme through all these chapters is they're hungry. And it's amazing what people do when they're hungry. As a matter of fact, according to uh, neurosciencenews.com, in the October 2016 article, hunger is a strong, this is what they say, hunger is a strong motivational force with the capacity to curb rival drive states such as thirst, anxiety, fear of predators, and social needs. Through a series of experiments, the researchers found that hunger may be at the peak of the motivational hierarchy. Now that surprised me. So if you have several competing drives, 
If hunger is one of them, it's going to win out over all the others. That surprised me because I would have thought the number one would be the, the, the drive of self-preservation. This is why people are naturally cowards. Nobody wants to say amen because nobody says, did he just call me a coward? Yeah. Why is that? Because we celebrate courage. Because courage is not normal. It takes somebody really bold and courageous to earn our respect because the vast majority of people are cowards. Self-preservation stands at the top of as what I would have thought. But no, apparently hunger will override your sense of self-preservation. It will, it will over, I was really shocked that it even overrides thirst because I get thirsty usually before I get hungry. I live in the desert. I'm pretty much thirsty all the time. And so hunger is the number one. So of, of all the... So, Everything driving this event is like they're hungry. And so Jacob says, look, I heard there was food in Egypt. Let's go get some. And so he's going to send the, the brothers down there. Now they're going to encounter Joseph, beginning verse 6. And he wants some confirmation of who they, you know, what are they like and particularly about his brothers. So notice what happens, verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers, spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said, they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. So it's said twice, because this is key to everything that's going to happen. They have no idea who, he's, who he is. <clears throat> and Joseph, verse 9 says, Joseph remembered the dreams they had dreamed of them. Which is found back in chapter 37. They would all bow down to him. And he said to them, you are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. Now, this is where it gets kind of humorous. Verse 10 and sad at the same time. They say to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. We're honest men. Yeah, we sold our brother into slavery. We lied to our dad. We're lying to you. But no, we're honest men. Self-deception is a fascinating thing. It's amazing how we will deceive ourselves. And sometimes it goes in different directions. I mean, some people look in the mirror and think, looking good. Everybody else is like, no. And some people look in the mirror and go, man, I look awful. Everybody else, man, well, I think you look great. And so, but it's amazing. How many of you have ever, like, watched the video or looked at the pictures and you don't look in there like you thought you did when you were doing it? Now, remember, we want to be honest people. Like, you know, you know that just doesn't look like the way I thought it looked. Like, Self-deception is a fascinating thing. And so, we're honest men. Um, and I don't know why that just... It just kind of strikes me as a, maybe the most shocking statement the whole thing, and Joseph's going to turn around on them. So now verse 12, he said to them, Nope, you've, it's the nakedness of the land you've come to see. Now, do you come to see if we're out of food here too? And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. They're still lying. Now, I find it fascinating they say one is no more. They don't say he's dead. They don't know what happened to him. So they say he's no more. Have you ever like worded things in such a way that you left a little bit ambiguous? You think, oh, no, not me. I'm an honest man. <laughs> yeah, right. So it, it kinda, it's kind of interesting the way they kind of word it here. Like they want to say, oh, we sold him. We don't know if he's alive or dead or what happened to him. They say he's no more. But Joseph said to them, no, nope, it's that I said to you, you are spies. So he said, by this you'll be tested by the life of Pharaoh. You will not go from this place unless your younger brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. So he, why is he doing this? Well, yeah, he wants to see his brother Benjamin. I mean, that's part of it. It's his blood brother and the rest of them are kind of half brothers. But there's more to it than that. He knows about the whole dynamic with all the moms and that his mom's the one who's loved the most. And he knows they don't like him for that and other reasons. So he's probably thinking, I wonder if, if Benjamin's really home with dad or if they did something to him too. Uh, he wants some affirmation that his brother is okay, not just their word, because the reality is he doesn't trust them. Now it is true, we don't trust people we don't know. We don't. This last week, I made a purchase through uh, from a guy from... Facebook Marketplace, and like we do, we arranged to meet in a parking lot, a little more neutral site. And so once we'd agreed on the time location, I sent him this message. I'm easy to spot. I'm the guy with the red motorcycle and a 1911 strapped to his hip. 
That's a gun if you're not sure. Now, why do I do that? Because I don't know this guy. I don't trust him. That's why we're not meeting in some secluded place. I want kind of a public place. And I want him to know, don't mess with me. I loved his response. Here was his response. I'll be the dude on the gray motorcycle with a 1911 strapped to his hip. I thought, I can trust him. <laughs> He's one of us. And, uh, so, yeah, and it was really funny when I did actually meet him. It's kind, of, you know, it's kind of like laughing about, you know, both kind of said the same thing. But why in the world did I send him? Because I don't know, I'm not going to trust him if I don't know him. I want to be a public place. I want him to know, you know, no funny business. Let's just do what we need to do and be done. Now, we get that. But it's really sad when there's somebody you know well and you can't trust them. Some people you don't trust them just because you don't know them. But when you know somebody, it says a lot about their character when you can't trust them. It's a lot about their track record. And so Joseph, he, he, he doesn't trust them because he knows them. And so he's not going to take their word for it about, uh, about his brother. So look what happens in verse 18. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. Now, why does he use the word God? He could have used the word Lord, which was God's name, Jehovah. But he says God because he doesn't want to give away yet who he is. So he just uses the generic term. You were honest men. Isn't that what they said? So he kind of drops it on You're honest men. Let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households. So he's backed off from making all ten stay and only one has to stay. And bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you will not die. And they did so. Now the word verified, the uh, Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And the word translated verify is the Hebrew word amen. So I want your words to be amen. So when we amen something, what we're saying is, I verify that. I agree with it. That's true. It's solid. Ah, yes. There you go. And so they want to say, I want to see your words are amen. I want to say they're, they're verified, that they're true and trustworthy and you will not die. And they did so. So verse 21, they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Now I want to say a couple things here. They are guilty. They feel guilty. But the Bible does not teach anywhere karma. Karma is a pagan religious idea that there's some force in the universe. The ultimate power in the universe is not some force that makes things balance out in the end. It is a living, personal God who dispenses justice in His time and His manner. Amen. So this is not karma, this is guilt. Uh, so we are, are guilty, and they, they sense that now God is bringing justice upon them. And, and I don't know, I mean, does it not just kind of strike you? He begged us. He was 17 years old when they sold him. They had him in a pit for a while. They pulled him out of the pit. They're getting ready to sell him. And he's looking at them, begging and pleading his own brothers, please don't sell me. Please don't do this to me. I mean, he's begging them. And one brother, the oldest brother, Reuben, says, man, I don't think we should do this. But the rest of them did. Okay. So Joseph knows everything that they're talking about. They spoke Hebrew, because that's what they did, Israelites. But Joseph, after all these years in Egypt, is speaking Egyptian, so there's going to be a translator. So look what happens in verse 23. They did not know that Joseph understood them. They're just talking about themselves in their native tongue. For there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Now, why did he take Simeon? Well, Simeon's child number two. She says, okay, now wait a minute. We got ten brothers. So really, ten of them didn't sell me into slavery. Nine did. I had one dude on my side. So I'm going to let him go home. So we're going to move down the line to the next oldest brother, who must have been the leader, being the oldest one to get him to do it. And so he takes Simeon and binds him and uh, takes him away. Now, these brothers are just scumbags. These are lousy, scumbag brothers. We already know that they sold Joseph into slavery and all that kind of thing. They've lied to their dad and all that. But you, know what I, you know what these nine guys are thinking? Yes, he took Simeon and not me. I get to go. I told you people are naturally cowards. Nobody steps up and goes, no, no, no. I, I volunteer. I'll do it. All right, y'all thinking Hunger Games. I volunteer as tribute. Let's just get it out there and get over with. And so he said, I'll volunteer. None of them do that. I mean, these guys have been scumbags. Now they go, hey, good, he took that guy. Like, I'm off the hook. And um, so they, they're just 
yeah, this is not good, guys. So look what happens in verse 25. Joseph's going to set this up. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in a sack and give them provisions for the journey. And this was done for them. They are, I mean, you can just see the guilt. Our brother begged us, and we did it anyway. We've lied to dad. I mean, they, they, here they are years later, and just the guilt on them. And, and guilt, listen, when you're guilty, it will never let you go. It'll hang to you. Here's how the way guilt works. So let's suppose they've done something bad. So let's put a pretty heavy weight on there. They did something bad. But that didn't the only thing they did. What did they have to do in addition to that? They had to lie to their dad. So they had something else. And now we find them continuing to lie to their dad. And here they are just the, as the years go by, the, the, the guilt just, it just keeps building up. This is what happens with guilt. Guilt just keeps weighing you down. And it just keeps adding because you have to come up with new ways to justify whatever it was that you did. And so the weight just keeps going and it just gets cumbersome and difficult. And, and, it, and listen, it does not go away. Here these brothers are years later. And it's like, some of you are here today and you are carrying guilt from something you did in high school 40 years ago. And it has weighed you down year after year after year after year after year. And this is what guilt does. It clings to you and it does not let go. And it, will, it weighs you down. So is there a way to get rid of this? Yeah, you confess it. Everybody wants to say amen. Because like, we're going to set up a mic and we're just going to have confession time. And you confess it. But they, they're, they're burdened. And that's what is, 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 they're driven by hunger, but they're weighed down by guilt. And the guilt of what they did to Joseph has stuck with them all of these years. And, um, and so now, verse 26, look what happens. It's going to get worse for them. They loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed and just left Simeon. Yeah, what a bunch of losers. As one of them opened his sack and gave his, uh, to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money's been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? You just see that it's just dripping with their guilt. So verse 29, When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, We're honest men. We have never been spies. There it is again. They just added one more weight to the carabiner. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I will know that you are not spies but honest men. And I will deliver your brother to you and you will trade in the land. And as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. Uh-oh. You can imagine how they're like, oh, crud. All of them. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Well, now that's just great, isn't it? If I don't bring the beloved son Benjamin back, why don't you kill your grandsons? Well, what kind of deal is this? This is to take my son. You can kill them if I don't bring back the one that you love. Man, these guys are just, I mean, they're just completely messed up. Put him in my hands. I'll bring him back to you. He says, so verse 38. But he said, my son will not go down with you, for his brother is dead. And he's the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. And you go, no, wait a minute, tell me. So nobody's going, oh, what's going to happen to Simeon? Don't care? As long as Ben gets to stay home. I mean, these, aren't his brothers are messed up. Dad's messed up. I, I mean, can you imagine? Some of you can, because some of you, this, this d defines in some ways, unfortunately, your childhood. What it's like to know that mom or dad or both of them have a favored child. And that they really don't care about you that much. It's really all about that child. And what it's like to be the, the not, not so loved child. How that would, would mess with you. It kind of reminds me of Faramir daughter and his uh, father, Thenador. And you go, wait a minute, what in the world are you talking about? You know, Thenador has two sons, Bormir and Faramir. 
And he's the steward of Gondor? Ah, yes. Okay, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you've neither read The Lord of the Rings nor have you watched the movies. So basically, Thinador has two sons. Boromir, the older son, he was loved. Dad thought he was grace things and sliced bread. And then there's Faramir, he's the second son. Yeah, not so much. Dad doesn't care for him. Boromir has died in battle. And now Faramir is being commissioned by his dad to go out into battle as well. And let's just watch the exchange between the two of them. That is a horrible way to parent. Okay, apparently y'all think that's a role model for parenting. That's a horrible way to parent. That's terrible. Now, I don't know what that's like because I've always been the favorite child. <laughs> yeah, not by even by a long shot. Um, but I cannot imagine. Can you imagine what it's like to be these brothers? You're thinking, man, he loved Joseph more than all of us. And now he didn't give... A, a rip about Simeon. He's down there in prison in Egypt. Could be, but it doesn't matter just as long as Ben gets to stay home. I mean, this is just, this family is, it's, it's, they're just a mess. They're just a mess. The brothers are, are just horrible scumbags the way they treat each other and the parents aren't really role models at all by any stretch. Certainly Jacob's not. But here's what is so amazing. These 12 brothers are the foundation of the nation of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel are named after these brothers. And Judah who's one of them that sold Joseph into slavery and then got his daughter-in-law pregnant, he is going to become the tribe from which the line of David will come. And David, who committed adultery, lied, murdered, a whole host of other issues, is going to be the line that the Messiah is going to come from. You know, wait a minute. You mean Jesus came from the line of a bunch of scumbag, lying, adulterous, murderous people? Exactly. When you read the Bible, you only discover on every single page, people are messed up. People on every page are carrying a heavy load of guilt. Jesus came because of people like Jacob and these 12 brothers. Because they needed to be forgiven. And you and I need to be forgiven. We carry a heavy load of guilt before God, but we need forgiveness. They needed forgiveness. Everybody in the Bible needed the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Now you're thinking, well, you know, maybe a little bit, but I'm not that bad a person. I'm actually pretty good. All right, let's just kind of put this to the test. Let's suppose that you're pretty good. Let's suppose that you only break one of God's rules three times a day. Three, that's it. You get three shots a day to think something bad, to be angry, mean, hurtful, adulterous thoughts, to steal, to be gluttonous or greedy or gossip uh oh but just three you know what I will agree you're a pretty good person wouldn't you agree that's pretty good just three times a day I mean we can knock that out before breakfast and then we're done like three times a day so I'm going to let's just kind of run the math if you only break one of God's rules three times a day in one year that's more than a thousand you think, well, how do you get to that? All right, put your phone calculator away. 365 times 3, we're rounding it to 1,000 to make it easier. Because I'm already losing some of you. And others of you I lost because you're an engineer and it's killing you that I rounded it to 1,000. So let's just say 1,000. Now let's just be even more generous and say that you never realized that you were doing anything wrong until you were 10 years old. Now we know better. 
I thought every parent in here would say, yes, we know better. But let's say that you don't, you're not conscious of any of those until you're 10. So they don't actually start counting against you until you're 10 years old and you live to 80. That's 70,000 times you've broken one of God's rules. How do you get 70,000? I'm going to help you. So you start at 10, you go to 80, that's 70 years. 1,000 per year is 70,000. Now, if you went to court and they open up the books and you have violated the law 70,000 provable times, and then you look at the judge and say, yes, but I helped a widow lady across the street. I was nice to people. I smiled at people. I was pleasant. I was basically a good person. Judge is going to look at you and go, I don't think so. 70,000. The reality is, 70,000 isn't even close. Some of you are like, man, if I start doing math, let's see. So I know I've done, I've done like twice the three a day. Yeah, ask the people who know you. Not even close. You go, man, I've, I've probably like, I've broken God's laws like 100 times a day or more. When you start running the numbers, you realize I have broken God's commands millions of times. I have a heavy, heavy load of guilt. How in the world can you and I get rid of that kind of guilt? We can't. We need somebody to get rid of it for us. And so God looks at us and says, man, you are guilty. I mean, you ought to feel guilty because you are guilty. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son to die on the cross and rise again so that all of your guilt can be removed and so that you can be forgiven and spend forever with me in heaven. It is through Jesus Christ that we can be forgiven of our heavy load of guilt. And it is taken away for good, forever, signed, sealed, and delivered through Jesus Christ. So let's just think about it. You show up to heaven. God says, why should I let you in? And you go, because I've been a pretty good person. God says, let's get the books. And he starts, and the more pages God turns, the more you start to squat and look your head down and kind of, is there a second entrance? <laughs> no. I mean, it just says the books go to you are so guilty. When I stand at the gates of heaven and God says, man, why in the world should you get in here? I'm going to say, because I'm perfect. And here's why. Because when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, all the millions of things that I've done wrong and will ever do wrong were all put onto Jesus' book. And he died for them on the cross for me to pay the penalty for my guilt. And Jesus' righteousness was put into my book. So that when my book is open, all you see is the righteousness, not mine, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because I stand in him, and in him I'm declared righteous before God. I will get into heaven not because I've been good, but because I've been declared righteous by Jesus Christ. I've been declared forgiven by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, my load of guilt was heavy, but my forgiveness is greater because of Jesus Christ. Amen. You and I meet people all the time who operate out of guilt. They know they're guilty. Their conscience bothers them. And, and there's a heavy burden. That they, and some of the reasons why some people act like such fools is because of the guilt they carry. What they need to hear is that your guilt can be removed through Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Him. The world needs to hear our message loud and long. In Jesus Christ, there is eternal forgiveness. The guilt can be removed forever. And these boys needed it. Their dad needed it. Their moms needed it. Their wives needed it. Their kids needed it. We all need the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't paint them up to look pretty good. The Bible says it like it is. They were guilty. But by God's grace can be forgiven. You and I are guilty. The good news is that by God's grace, we can be forgiven. Our Heavenly Father, I know that when we read it, Stuff like this. The details are different. We don't load up donkeys and go to Egypt. Yeah, food, we just get in the car and go to the grocery store. But the reality is being guilty is something that all of us know. Our conscience convicts us just like it did these brothers. But Father, we thank you that that's not the end of the story. But that in Jesus Christ, they found forgiveness and we can find forgiveness. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to celebrate the fact that our guilt is gone, that the righteousness of Jesus is put on our account. When we, amen, when we verify that Jesus is the one we've put our faith in. So, Father, we confess today that we are guilty, but we rejoice that in Jesus Christ we can also confess forgiveness. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.